Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you for sticking around and for those coming in. Come all the way down, all the way down to the front, right there, Mike. Uh, all right, so next up, we have Jess Dodson um, talking about the InfoSec talents hiding right under your nose. Now, I've asked my good friend ChatGPT again to write me a little bio on Jess. So, introducing Jess, the cyber magician Dodson, with a wave of their enchanted USB wand, they can make hackers vanish in a puff of digital smoke. Like Jess's knack for turning vulnerabilities into amusing anecdotes has earned them the title of Comedic Crypto Crusader. So, if you're in the need of protection and a good laugh, Jess, the cyber magician, is your go-to wizard. Prepare to be enchanted by their cybersecurity magic. Is this a magic show? I'll take it. Look, I'll take it. I'm totally fine with that. <laughs> we have a warm round of applause for Jess. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming along, considering it is Friday afternoon and most of you are probably ready for a nap right about now. Um, a big thank you to the OzCert crew, so Mike and Beck, for having me. This is my third year presenting, I think. Um, I don't take for granted every time they keep accepting the talk presentations that I throw in for shits and giggles and then go, oh crap, now I have to actually write that presentation, damn it. Um, so for those who don't know me, my name is Jess Dodson. Hopefully some of you do know who I am. I do recognise some faces in the crowd. Um, I do go by Girl Germs online, so you may have come across me in some of your stumbles or trips around the internet. Um, I am, and bear with me, because this title is an absolute mouthful. I am a senior cloud solution architect engineering in cybersecurity and privacy for Microsoft. That is my full title. It is an absolute mouthful. I do identity and security stuff. That's my job. Um, prior to being with Microsoft, I worked for higher education and state government here in Queensland. Um, and I've been a sysadmin for most of my job. And I still refer to myself as a recovering systems administrator. Like, that's what I still am, really. Um, I don't think it's something you really grow out of. Um, so I kind of tripped, slipped, fell into cybersecurity in a weird way, um, which is what we're here to talk about. So you've all sort of been tricked into coming to a talk where I get to talk a little bit about myself and my somewhat winding career path, but I promise it'll be worth it because the whole idea of this is to give you an idea of where you can find really good infosec talent that is hiding right there in your organisations or in your wider communities and you just don't even realise it yet. And yes, there are lots of cat memes because it's Friday afternoon and everyone needs entertainment. So I've always been interested in tech from a very young age. There's been tech all around me. I've had access to computers for ever. Um, I was a very lucky child in the 80s, and I'm dating myself, um, to have computers at home, and I've had an internet connection for as long as I can remember. A big apology to my dad for the ISDN bills that I must have racked up when I was a, a kid. Um, it started off originally as a love for games, but I loved tech in general. I liked poking things, I liked poking computers. And I liked being able to take things apart and put things back together again. So a quick raise of hands of the folks here. Who here used to, or still does, take things like ballpoint pens apart just because you can? Just, yeah, look, pretty much everybody. Um, and I think there's just something about us that makes, it want, makes us want to know how stuff works, what all the parts are, and then be able to put it back together again. It's just how our brains work. So 
I studied IT very early. Um, I did well at school for IT and then bombed absolutely everything else. I failed miserably. My parents will 100% blame it on my boyfriend at the time, who is now my husband, um, but it was 100% Diablo 2. So for any other Blizzard tragics out there, yes, I am hanging out for the Diablo 4 service slam this weekend. Um, but there was no uni for me. I didn't get a chance to go to uni. I definitely didn't have the marks for it. So I went to TAFE instead, which worked out fine. So I studied a uh, cert for and a diploma in network engineering and network management. I know, I'm full of surprises. I've got network management skills, who knew? Um, there weren't any cyber security qualifications, certifications that just didn't exist back then. And even if it had, I'm not even sure at that point in time that I would have even looked at it. It's not the kind of thing that I think I even recognised what it was. Um, I don't think back in the early 2000s, many folks even realised what cyber security was back then. Um, but after graduating from TAFE, I was in a little bit of limbo. Like, I had these skills and nowhere to apply them. I was just twiddling my thumbs, still working a job at McDonald's, which is not particularly technical. Um, and that is where I truly learnt that it's not what you know, but who you know mantra. So who here has heard that one before? Keep your hands up if it's paid off for you at some point, that you have been able to get a job or an interview because of someone you knew. Yeah, quite a few hands still up. Um, and I think it's, it's one of those things that we don't really put enough emphasis on, that it is the people that we know. So one of the ladies that I studied with at TAFE, an amazing human, was working at UQ and mentioned that she knew of an area that was looking for a help desk person and put me in touch. And that's how my tech career began. So um, I started at the very bottom, working my way up two, three days a week to eventually five days a week as a help desk lackey. I started down in the trenches doing computer builds and helping people install their laptops. And yes, I will replace that mouse because no cordless mouse does not mean you cut the cord off, that kind of thing. Um, and I think this is where I properly learnt what it meant to have a career in tech, that it's, the tech is the easy part, it's the people that are the harder part, um, and that is 100% a talk for another time <laughs> that I already have written. Um, but it was my introduction to how tech is what makes things work, but it, it's what underpins a business, it's not the actual business. So it's the people that we are helping, our customers and our users are who are running the business. We're just there to help support them, and we have to remember that. Now, let me tell you, if you want to understand how an organisation works, you need to have a chat to the help desk or service desk folk in your organisation. If there is anyone in your organisation who knows who's who in the zoo, who knows who you need to speak to to get stuff done, it is going to be those folk because they have their fingers in all of the pies and they know how your organisation operates because they are your front line. So, at some point in my first year, um, the one of the folks that I worked with decided that he wanted to move on to greener pastures, God bless him, um, and a role opened up in the team that I was in casually, and I was encouraged to apply, and I did. But this was the first time I'd had to go through all of the proper hoops, selection criteria and cover letters and interview panels. Um, and it was my very first proper interview panel, so being on this side now of an interview panel many, many times and having interviewed lots and lots of folks, I now totally realise that those people who are interviewing are just as invested in you doing well <laughs> as you are invested in doing well. But at the time, 100% absolutely terrified. Um, but I did get the role, which is great. I ended up landing a job as an IT officer. Um, for anyone who works at a uni, should be familiar with the title. Um, in reality, it just meant that I was a sysadmin. That was, that was what I did. I got to be a proper systems administrator. That was my job. That was what I was doing. Uh, so getting the job was great, but it came with a caveat. <laughs> I had to get a degree. I didn't have one of those. So I had to actually go off to uni. Kind of makes sense. You work for a uni. They want you to have a uni degree. Mm, 
yeah. So I started studying part-time, working full-time, studying part-time, and again, there's no such thing as a cyber security specific degree. When I was studying, it was just IT. There wasn't what I would consider to be anything cyber security specific. I think there, there would have been like one cryptology subject that I attempted and went, no, 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 I don't have the math skills for that shit, no way. <laughs> um, but nothing that was aimed at security or systems administration or even network administration at the time. It was all very IT project management coding based. Um, but in the job that I was doing, so, so being a sysadmin, um, keeping the systems that I was helping to build and run and operate secure as much as possible, security is just part of what you had to do. Like even if it wasn't in your title or in your job description, it's just kind of something you did whether you even realised it or not. Um, at least in the area where I was, and I'm sure many folks are in the same position, there's no, in some teams, there's no dedicated security team. Like you just have to do it <laughs> because if you don't do it, who's going to do it? Um, so I was at UQ for about seven years um, and had managed to work my way up to the very ceiling of where I could go um, and I felt like I'd kind of hit that limit, like there was nowhere else for me to go and I needed more of a challenge, maybe a little bit more money as well, that would be nice. Um, so I jumped ship uh, while I was still studying as well, mind you, so I was still studying my degree at that point and I got a job with Queensland Government um, and this was officially when I landed my systems administrator role. Um, it did eventually change to identity administrator. I got very much pigeonholed off into identity eventually. But the role that I was hired on for was very much Windows server administration. That was what I was hired to be able to do. And it was a much larger environment than any that I'd previously operated. So working at UQ in the little school that I was in was about 20 or 30 or so servers. I'm now helping run a fleet of a thousand plus. It's a little bit of a scale. I mean, I, I did say I wanted a challenge and I certainly gave myself a bit of a challenge there. Um, with this one though, I think, and as a technical person in any of those kind of teams, this is where you start to learn a lot more about things like risk management and incident management and ITIL and where everyone starts to fall asleep. Um, and it sort of started making my way into my consciousness that I was still doing some security things. It's just that, again, not in my job description, not really in my title. It's just something someone had to do because, again, if I'm not doing it, who else is going to do it? Um, while we did have, and we, they still do have a security team there, bless their cotton socks, um, one of the things that I did end up having to do was look after an Active Directory environment. And that's just something that I enjoy doing. That's how I got my identity title. Um, and it was much bigger than any of the Active Directory domains or forests that I'd previously operated, so that was lots of fun. Um, Probably as well for those of you who've ever had to deal with the ASD Essential 8, I'm sure none of you have had to deal with that, some of the operational life cycle stuff, so that tended to fall into my little bucket, so doing all of the operating system stuff and making sure you're on N minus one, which everyone here is on. Yes, I'm seeing nodding, no one's, no one's running server 2003 or 2008, right? I'm looking at a lot of shamed faces right now. Um, I say it with love because I had to do it myself. So that was, that was what I did. That was pretty much three years of my life. Um, this is probably where I had that light bulb moment. And I think a lot of folks who are in operations have the same one. So for me, my aha moment um, came as part of a, an assessment that we had done. Uh, we had uh, someone come in hilariously from Microsoft to run a uh, security assessment on our Active Directory environment, um, on our production forest. So much red. I swear I cried. The amount of red that I saw on that, oh, terrifying. Um, and I think that was the moment that I realised that we as techs, doesn't really matter what you are, whether it's Active Directory or network security or database administration, it doesn't really matter. 
if you've had any of that kind of a, a holy shit moment where you've realized that maybe there's stuff that I need to fix from a security perspective, um, it's that you're in SecOps. You may not realize it, again, not in your title, not in your job description, but if you're the one that's being asked to fix that stuff, that's security operations. Um, and it was, for me, the realization that at least the work that I was doing around identity systems um, was very much tied to security. And I'm very tired of saying it, and I have to say it so much for my job. Identity is the new security perimeter. Um, but knowing that the work that I was doing was tied to security kind of, it was a little bit of a light bulb moment. It was the, I am doing some security related stuff because I am helping to build the security of the operations that I am working on, that I am helping build, my environment that I help look after. Um, so this led to the very first talk that I ever gave, which was on the security of Active Directory, which is very dated now. Um, but I wrote it because I figured that if I was amazed by what I'd found, I'm sure others would be equally amazed and also horrified at what they had to fix in their own environments. Um, but this did cement that idea that identity and security were one and the same and that the work that I was doing, whether it was identity administration, was still security in some way. And, and that was kind of an epiphany, especially for the next move that I made. So um, a close friend and colleague of mine sent me a link to say that Microsoft were hiring PFEs, as they were known back in the day, um, and I applied. and. I got the job, which was a little bit of a surprise to me, let me tell you, I didn't actually expect to get hired. I thought it would be a really good experience, go for the interview, see what happens. Oh shit, now I'm hired by them, crap. <laughs> um, so I've now been working with Microsoft for just shy of four years, I'll be four years in just over a week actually, um, and in that time I've worked now with over a hundred different organizations across Australia and New Zealand. I've had multiple managers, multiple skips. I've had multiple roles. Like my, my title has changed so many times. I'm pretty sure it's changing again in June. Um, but the job that I do at the moment is very much embedded in security. So while I started working on Active Directory, I was hired on to do identity related stuff. Um, a lot has changed in four years. Four years, it sounds like a short period of time, but it has been a very long period of time for me in tech. So I do a lot of identity related stuff, Definitely not as much on-prem as I used to, more cloud focused, but my focus now has shifted very much to security. Um, and I want to give a shout out to Shelley and Vanessa for some of the conversation topics they brought up um, because I'm going to deviate just slightly here. Um, as someone who has kind of fallen into security, um, the effect that imposter syndrome has on those of us who, who didn't come through the normal channels, who didn't start in a SOC or get a certification and then that's what we ended up doing, um, and I'm sure many feel the same, it's, it's the work that we've done, it's the experience we've had and the other jobs or roles we've had that have made us kind of find our way into security. So imposter syndrome even now is something that's pretty big for me because I have this weird security in my title now and it doesn't feel right almost. It feels weird. It's a hat that doesn't sit quite right. Um, I still refer to myself permanently as a recovering sysadmin. That's how I introduce myself to customers because I still do a ton of work on identity systems. I do a ton of work on security systems too, but the work that I do a lot of the time is around operations and helping operations staff work well with security. And that is how all of this ties nicely together. So I promise you haven't been tricked too much. So I understand that a lot of you are like, that's great. It's lovely to hear you talking about yourself. That's wonderful. Where is the InfoSec talent that's hiding? Come on, get to the point. Um, and I think for me, it's that every step of the way from being a student through to a help desk lackey through to doing system administration identity administration and now actually being in security as an architect again sounds weird to me um, 
all of these roles in some way involved security, even if they weren't in my title until now. Okay? And in every role that I have ever worked in, there have been others in the teams that I've been in who have had a fascination or interest in security and wanted to do more with security. Um, and I think we don't give enough of an opportunity to some of those people. I, I feel that the reason that I'm, I'm good at what I do, or at least I hope I'm good at what I do, is because of the experience that I've had, not in spite of, that the work that I've done around operations is what helps me be good at the job that I do now, focusing very much on the security of those systems. And that's great, I hear you say, but what can we do? How do we find these people? Where are these people that you say are hiding there that we need to get a hold of? And, and that's what we're here for. So. What's coming up next is what you can do for the different types of people that you will come across in your career. And there will be bits that I will talk a little bit about and bits that I will talk a lot about. So what can you do? So for students, they often have absolutely no idea what they want to do or be when they grow up. I mean, I don't know about many of you, but most of us still aren't properly grown up. Um, so there could be some amazing talent at universities and TAFEs that are totally unaware that a career in cybersecurity could be for them, that it's something that they would be really, really good at and really enjoy. So first thing that I would suggest is if you are looking for new talent, make sure that you have a contact with your local uni or TAFE or both, even better, um, to find you good people who will be a good fit for your team. Um, it's literally how I landed my first job. And it's also how many folks who ended up on my team ended up getting hired. So my boss at the time became friends with the course coordinator at my local TAFE, uh, and she had her flag any new talent that she felt would be a really good fit. We ended up hiring at least half a dozen folks during my time there, just from, again, it's not what you know, but who you know. So those contacts are so important. Um, within your organisations, having internship programs, so being able to get people in to at least try it out so that you can get students in early and not only just students that are looking at cybersecurity, but folks in other areas of tech. Um, look at folks who are doing systems administration, network administration, software design, coding, um, your database admins. You want folks with that diverse background and education to be able to help you because they will come then with the knowledge of those systems and be able to aid you in securing those systems. Um, my team is a really interesting one. I'm in a really, really diverse team right now. I don't actually know of more than say two or three in my team of 30 who have IT or computer science degrees. We've got a very weird mismatch of chemistry and biomedical science and psychology. I know we've got someone with an English literature degree and they may seem completely irrelevant, but all of them bring some level of skill to the job that they have now. The other really big one here is that we need to ensure that for folks who are just starting out, that they have a way of getting their foot in the door. I don't, I hate the catch 22. You need experience to get a job, but you need a job to get experience. And I still see it now with a lot of entry level positions where it's, you need two plus years of experience. How do I get experience if I can't get a bloody job? So making sure that when we are hiring for entry level positions, that they are actually entry level. We're not looking for people who have extreme amounts of experience or even a couple of years of experience. You want someone who's keen to learn, who shows an interest, so that way you can give them a chance, okay? We shouldn't be seeing you need experience from an entry level position. In the wider community, like this one here at OzCert. So user groups, conferences, online communities, especially now when we're seeing those after effects of COVID and remote work, um, and particularly this year, what we refer to as the great layoffs of 2023, there are so many folks out there who are clamouring for a job. So many people who are looking for some form of work. So as I mentioned, don't just go for those who are security trained. 
Look for skills in other areas that can be of use to you and can be of aid in what you are trying to do or what you're trying to secure. Um, look for folks who are interested in a career change, who may have spent the past 15, 20 years doing system administration or software design and are looking at changing into a different career path. Um, they can lead to some of the most amazing and loyal colleagues and employees that you could ever hire. Technical skills can be taught, like we can teach tech. Tech is easy, but finding a good fit for your organisation, finding good people to fit your team is so much harder. So don't look past someone just because they don't tick all of the boxes on your wish list. And let's be honest, it's a wish list. It's, it's not an absolute requirement. It's, I would like them to have these things, but it's not absolutely necessary. Um, Reach out to those who are in your networks to see who is looking. Look and see if there are people that you can help. Um, your wider community and your network is pivotal to finding new folks to bring into the cybersecurity community. For those who are early in career, um, and Shelley brought it up actually, don't pigeonhole people. Like, we shouldn't be pigeonholing people um, just because they're fresh in the door and they've said, this is what I'm gonna be doing. Again, they're not fully grown up. They haven't fully formed their prefrontal cortex. They may not know what they want to do. So make sure you're offering them every opportunity to find out what actually interests them. Give them the opportunity to try out new things. For many in tech, their first jump into tech isn't into a SOC. It's to a help desk or a service desk. Like That's where they first start. So if they're showing an interest, get them involved. Like involve them in some way, bring them into your tabletop exercises or your incident response tests or your DR exercises, like bring them in in some way to see whether this is something that they actually want to do. Um, the other thing I'll say is look at taking on mentees. Um, you would be surprised at how much you as someone in security knows and being able to pass that on to someone else and and share that to someone else can be incredibly rewarding both for you and for them um, you're going to end up with someone in your organization hopefully who can now grow into that role because of the information you've been able to give them if you're in management, and I, I know that some of you folks are, um, and you have an eye on someone who's early in career who you think would be a good fit, reach out to some of the seniors in your own team and get them to take these early in career folk under their wing. So you want these people to feel comfortable and confident enough to A, be able to ask questions. Um, I'm a very big believer in there is no such thing as a stupid question. You want people to ask questions and be able to make mistakes, because you learn from being able to make mistakes. And I think that's probably one of the biggest things that we fail at as an industry is we like to lay blame on people. And for those who are early in career, they need to make those mistakes to learn. So we need to make sure that we're not living in a blame culture. Um, probably lastly, and this will apply to everyone, provide training. <laughs> Because there's no point in saying that you're keen to see people get upskilled if you're not willing to give them the time and the training they need in order to get those skills. Now, this is where I'm going to talk quite a lot because this is where my passion lies. And these are the folks that I absolutely love because it's where you will find so much talent. And Mike went and stole my thunder with his opening address yesterday. Um, but... The folk that are in your operations teams are your hidden talent. They are where you are going to find so many great people who can help you in security. But the question that you need to ask yourselves around them is, do you want to shift them into security or are they better off staying where they are but helping you in the team that they're currently in? Um, so there's a reason we talk a lot about SecOps, okay? The idea of SecOps is that there is a good flow of communication between those teams and those roles. No, it is not one person wearing two hats. And if it's one person wearing two hats, I'm very, very sorry. That's a very crowded head for you. Um, but the idea is to make sure that your operations and your security folks are talking to one another. And most importantly, that security isn't just a last minute thought, that it's built into what we do day in and day out. And 
That may mean that you want some of the amazing folks in your ops team to be part of your security team, both because of their organisational knowledge and because of their technical chops, but also because of the fact that they want to learn more and be involved in security and pivot into that. That's what they want to do. And that's how I landed where I am now. It's, it's that combination of both operations and security work that keeps me interested in doing what I'm doing right now. At the same time, you may have folks who are happy doing what they're doing and don't want to make that jump, but they're still interested in helping in any way that they can, and they feel a little bit hindered in being able to do that. And, and this, my lovely friends, is where we really fail. We don't tend to play nicely. We don't let other people come and play in our sandpit with us. We tend to kick people out, and I'm not really a big fan of it. Um, we need to get better at allowing everyone to help in whatever way they can. We're stretched thin as it is. You have tools that your operations folks can use and use to their benefit and to your benefit, and we sequester them away and make it much, much harder for them to be able to do their job. Um, for many security teams, you're stretched thin as it is. You don't have enough bums on seats to be able to get done everything that you need to get done. So leverage what you have available to you. Leverage the teams that are already in your organisations that can assist you in doing the stuff that needs doing. Um, I am fed up, <laughs> that is the politest term I can use at a conference, with going into organisations and finding siloed teams security, identity, cloud operations, on-prem networks, no one talking to one, one another, duplication of logging, duplication of tools, no one being able to utilise each other's tools. It, it's a waste of money, it's a waste of time, it makes life harder for everybody, and in the end, it's going to make things more insecure, let's be perfectly honest. So that duplication of effort is something that I want to see disappear. Um, if you can take just one thing away from this particular talk, it's please look at getting your teams to work together and use those staff that you already have in those teams who want to help you in security. Please, for the love of God. And lastly, I want to talk about those of us who are already in security. Um, if you're here at OzCert, chances are you've already got a team, albeit it might be a team of one. Um, but you're doing some form of security work and you want to make sure that you are retaining them, that you are keeping hold of those staff because it's hard to get good talent. It's hard to find good people. So losing those folks is something you want to avoid, obviously. So look after the staff that you have, listen to them and aid them when they are looking for new challenges because if they can't find what they're looking for in your organisation, they will then go and look elsewhere. So we need to make sure that we do whatever we can to hold on to the talent we have because they've got just as much organisational knowledge as anybody else. You don't want that walking out the door. Um, the other thing is as well, and I find this quite a lot when I'm dealing with organisations, make sure your security folks don't feel threatened by other tech staff getting involved in security. Um, they're not going to lose their jobs just because you've now got some other teams getting involved. It's exactly the same as when automation came about. Automation isn't going to take away people's jobs. Having your operations folks doing some security is exactly the same. All it's going to allow you to do is actually do more cool stuff. Um, what I found is when there is that fear, that's when more cloistering happens, that's when more siloing of information and people tend to clam up and not share, and that just makes life harder for, for everyone. We want to be able to bring more people in and not push people out at the same time. So we need to look after the folks that we already have. So hopefully you've been able to take away somewhere where you'll be able to find just a little bit of talent, be it in your local uni or TAFE or your current service desk, or please use your operations folks and at least talk with them. Um, I'd like to thank OzCert very much for having enough faith to put me forward to speak 
yet again on a whim. Um, and a thank you to everyone here for coming and listening and for those who are listening at home. Um, again, this is very much told from my experiences, my journey, my perspective. Yours may differ, uh, mileage may vary, but I truly hope that you've been able to take something away from this um, and that you'll be able to find the talent that I know is hiding somewhere in your organisation. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Thank you, Jess. Uh, do we have any questions in the room? I'm just double checking. There's one question online. Mm -hmm. uh, so, thank you, Peter. Touching on a topic from some other presentations, have you ever had to deal with imposter syndrome as you've progressed through your career? <laughs> yes, yes, and yes. Um, I'm, I'd like to say that I'm not a big fan of fake it till you make it, but I kind of am. Like, I'm, I'm full of bullshit and bravado, and I will happily just give it a go and see what happens. Um, and I think that's probably s s fared me in good stead in my career, and that's probably why I can do what I do now. I think there is a little bit, though, of being able to back yourself a little bit or having people who can help you realise your own abilities um, and making sure that you've got people who will be like, no, 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 you've got this, you're good at this, you'll be fine when your own brain is telling you that you can't. And that's where having someone like a, a good network of mentors or mentees sort of thing. Absolutely. Another shameless plug for the Australian Women in Security Network <laughs> mentoring program, everyone. Uh, are there any questions in the room? Alrighty. Thank you very much, Jess. Awesome.